China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. In the West, it's not only wrong, but often illegal for an employer to discriminate against someone with a history of substance use, as long as the person has been rehabbed. But recently in China, the production company behind hit crime drama series The Knockout was pressurized by millions of fans into deleting scenes featuring an actor who turned out to be an ex-junkie in real life, while vowing a zero-tolerance attitude for drug use. The actor played a supporting role of a drug dealer and was lauded at first for his acting skills. But viewers soon recognized him to be the former singer Han Xiao, who was kind of big in the 90s. That made his detention a well-publicized case. In 2009, he was caught by police for taking drugs including meth and ecstasy. And after spending the next three years in a mandatory rehab center and having recovered from addiction, he became a drug awareness ambassador appointed by the Beijing city government. And in order to start afresh, he changed his name to Han Pujun and set aside a portion of his wealth to create a charity fund. And over the past decade, he took up acting jobs and played minor roles in a number of TV series without causing suspicion. But this time, the very success of the knockout blew his cover. Many people are outraged to learn that celebrities with drug-taking history could actually get around anti-drug rules and get back their high-paying jobs. Now, unlikely to make another comeback ever again, Han Xiao's showbiz career has effectively ended. But a moral debate on whether ex-addicts could receive a second chance has begun and ended rather quickly. The public answer is a resounding no. China has a strict legal and moral codes on drug-related issues. While the anti-drug law stipulates that persons receiving treatment of a drug addiction shall not be discriminated against while they go to school, get employed, or receive social welfare, there's a catch to it. You could be subject to additional government decrees and industry rules that bar you from getting back your career. If you're a celebrity, you will never be allowed to re-emerge in public view. For example, the National Radio and Television Administration, China's top media regulator, explicitly bans TV stations and other media outlets from broadcasting any content featuring stars who have used drugs or visited prostitutes. Legal experts say this ban should be interpreted to encompass all platforms, including live streaming, stage shows, and virtually any commercial performance. And that means the moment you're caught using drugs, your stardom is over. Doesn't this contradict with the law? Why is China so unforgiving to those who turn over a new leaf? Why punish them further when they are in need of societal support? But in fact, China is hardly an exception in meeting out severe punishment for drug offenses. Asian governments are generally much harsher than the Western counterpart in terms of anti-drug policies. And whatever color ribbon programs there may be, Asian cultures attach much stronger stigma and shame to those with a drug history. Why? Reason number one, history. In ancient China, people used to have a more lax attitude towards drugs, which were concocted by alchemists to boost health, longevity, or sexual performance. And these substances were often toxic and restricted the upper echelon of a society. But things changed in the 17th century when Western colonial powers got involved in the lucrative opium trade, setting off an enormous social trend in China for smoking opium as a recreational drug. What was thought to be harmless leisure turned out to be life-destroying addiction. And the Qing government had no other choice but banning the use of opium, which led to a clash between China and Britain in the mid 19th century known as the Two Opium Wars. After losing the wars, China was forced to pay money, cede territories, and further open up its market. Worse still, it led to a series of similar arrangements with other colonial powers, effectively plunging China into a century of humiliation. Now if you go to Beijing's Tiananmen Square, there is a giant obelisk called People's Heroes Monument. You will see on its pedestal reliefs depicting eight major revolutionary events that led to the founding of a new China. And the very first episode among them is the destruction of opium in 1839. The U.S. 
whatever add Richard Nixon to Mount Rushmore for declaring war on drugs, or erect a statue for the DEA agent who hunted down Pablo Escobar on Lafayette Square. Can you imagine anti-drug movements occupying such a central place in the narrative of regime's legitimacy to rule? That one of the first social reforms introduced by the communist government in the 1950s was to eradicate opium in China. Millions of addicts were forced into treatment, dealers were executed, and poppy fields were replanted with other crops. They were sending a message, never again shall we ever condone something that nearly destroyed us. And for this reason, China doesn't view drug using as a mere personal vice, or drug addiction as a medical condition, but something much more corrupt, dangerous, and inherently evil that could eventually trigger a civilizational collapse. And reason number two, morality. Every society has its own moral standards, but unlike many places where the church plays a dominant role in teaching morals, China doesn't have a lot of churches, even if you count the underground ones. Religion isn't a central part of Chinese social life. So who's gonna shape our character and teach us to be good? A state. Not a church, but a state. There's no separation of church and state. That dichotomy didn't exist in China. In this regard, China is different from many former communist nations where state atheism didn't quite survive the collapse of Soviet Union. Many former Soviet countries have become more religious. Just look at Putin and his bestie Kirill, the patriarch of Orthodox Church. Because religion was always there, fundamental to people's way of life. But China doesn't have a strong monotheistic tradition. It's not as if Revolution or dictatorship suddenly killed it, leaving a natural spiritual vacuum that is to be refilled later. It just wasn't there. So as to create a moral order, the Chinese Confucian state has engaged for centuries the intellectual class, which in modern times has expanded to include writers, musicians, actors, artists, and other cultural workers in general, who, in Joseph Stalin's words, are engineers of the human soul. For example, Music is viewed both in ancient Greece and China as a powerful shaper of our character. Those who use it as a vehicle to express possess the ability to profoundly influence us for good or for evil. And not just musicians, but cultural workers in general, through their works, inculcate moral values, provide moral basis, and guide a society along the moral path. In this way, they function like the clergy, save for that they don't officiate weddings. So, in order to maintain a good moral influence on the people, naturally, the government wants to remove bad apples from the barrel, just like the Catholic Church would sack pedophile priests. And to carry this church analogy one step further, think of the best cultural workers, according to the socialist ideal, as canonized saints, for whom moral integrity should weigh as much, if not more, than their artistry. This is what China demands of them. Okay, even before the communists came into power, Chairman Mao delivered a famous speech in Yang'an outlining the role of literary and the art workers in the revolutionary struggle, which is not to create art for art's sake, but to serve the proletariat and masses of the people. Translation, as ideological vanguards, you need a sense of direction. And in the post-Mao era, market-oriented reforms gradually reached the cultural field once was a cautiously guarded bulwark of ideology and gave rise to an entertainment industry that had been non-existent. Money and fame transformed the saints into idols worshipped by millions of people. And the state has also receded from its previously omnipresent role, but still looms large. Now it doesn't always dictate explicitly what kind of cultural product people should or should not consume, as long as they are promoting virtues, pointing in the right direction, and echoing with the main melody. Instead of complaining the Chinese government of being a snoopy meddler, we should probably take a more nuanced view that a wider state insists on moving the whole side in a specific direction. And the third reason is money. We've covered history and politics, two areas most people don't give up, whatever. But still, Chinese internet users, ordinary folks like me, were outraged by the ex-junkies TV appearance. Some criticisms were so fierce that they could be shocking to strangers from outside our culture. But in China, 
Every time a morally compromised celebrity attempts to make a comeback, he or she is going to face intense public anger. That scum will get a second chance over my dead body. So in spite of being commercially successful, or perhaps exactly because of it, celebrities have trouble coming back. They will not be only deplatformed by the state, but also cancelled by the crowd. Oh yes, another type of cancel culture here, rooted in another kind of social justice. Any surprise? In China, it is widely believed that big money in entertainment has distorted the acting profession, so much so that popular actors and actresses are grossly overcompensated for their often subpar acting skills. Such a reward system that confers an obscene amount of money to the incompetent few can only be justifiable with additional clauses on their behaviors. So celebrities are scrutinized from all angles, sometimes to the extent of being dehumanized. If you think about the idol's implicit bargain of staying single and available to satisfy fans' sexual fantasies, ew, disgusting. But it's almost like a Faustian bargain. Freedom and money, you may only choose one. If you've sold your soul to the devil, play by his rules. You can't have your cake and eat it too. If you make mistakes, exit now. Choose any other line of work and the law is there to help you reintegrate into society, but never dream of coming back again. You ruin a chance. As an interesting observation, entertainment industry in the West is just as ruthless, but the effect it has on celebrities and the public opinion around them couldn't be more different. The industry is awash with drugs. The trend has begun at least since the 1930s and got strengthened during the counterculture movement in the 1960s. Songs and movies have started to feature drug use so frequently that an average teenager was exposed to 85 such references per day. And this stat was obtained before the opioid crisis, now more than a decade old. And people argue whether such exposures have educated children to stay away from drugs or encouraged them to experiment with danger. To be frank, contemporary popular culture should be at least be partially held accountable for liberalizing the attitude towards psychoactive drugs, which then contributes to drug becoming an epidemic in the West. Not only did it manufacture content that glorifies and glamorizes drug-related lifestyles, but also corrupted role models for young people. Personally, I admit some of the greatest artworks were produced under direct influence of drugs. Young people could be tempted to think that the drugs did wonder to their favorite stars, giving them inspiration. But no, well this could be my Chinese bias, but I think more often than not, they were used to calm stage fright, overcome emotional barriers, relieve mental stress, or widen social circles. Of course it's a two-way thing, a lot of them did drugs before they rose to stardom, but they wouldn't become so reliant and addicted had it not been pushed to the extreme to be milk dry by bosses in the industry. Without drugs, there will be fewer personal tragedies and a richer cultural heritage for mankind. And altogether, these factors have contributed to a huge gap between East and West. It's not just about different perspectives, but it reaches the deepest level of cultures, even reflected in linguistics. In, in Chinese, we call drugs dupin, literally poisons. So all drugs are poisons. Heroin, a poison. Coke, a poison, meth, a poison, LSD, a poison, even the weed is regarded as a poison. Poisons are dangerous. You touch them, you die. On the contrary, real poisons like arsenic and cyanide are called du yao, or poisonous drugs. You know, poisonous, sure, but still drugs, maybe past expiration date. So drugs are worse than actual poisons. You think about it, it's quite funny. So that's our attitude toward drugs. Harsh, unforgiving, were seen as intolerant or even inhumane to many Westerners. But the questions for policymakers are, where do you want to go? What do you want to achieve with all the leniency, sympathy, and tolerance? Would the underground drug lords have any mercy on the law enforcement officers? I don't know. But I know what works for China may not be the right answer for the West, and vice versa. That's why I love our cross-culture show. It brings the world closer. With that, I thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you want to learn more about China or have any thoughts and comments on our show, please contact us at the email address below. Looking forward to hearing from you.